Okay, welcome back to Rockstock Channel. It is Sunday, April 2nd, and Palm Sunday for all who celebrate. We, But it's the end of the first quarter, and that means we're going to talk about the scoreboards for lithium, a little bit on nickel and graphite as well. We've called this Lithium Squeeze Box in an homage to the WHO. Thank you to Albemarle and Liontown for publicizing Albemarle's essentially hostile approach, right? They were on the tape owning, I don't know, 2.2% and more recently 4.4%. So Albemarle through open market purchases has spent at least $100 million just on market. This is not like what they did when Mineral Resources had an auction for Wajina and they just participated in an auction. This has been an aggressive Albemarle, you know, just on market. And now if you look at the press release that Albemarle put out, they're, they're basically saying the board is not seriously engaging with them and they want to go and talk directly to the shareholders. And Liontown put out that they're, you know, Albemarle's asked for the share register. So there's a lot more to come here, but price of Liontown is now trading above the 250 cash bid that Albemarle put in. To put this in context, I think we may have men mentioned this in a prior video. This is a huge commitment, I think, by Albemarle. 3.4 billion US dollars is equivalent to 13.5% of Albemarle's $26 billion market cap. And for context, we talked and speculated that Tesla, you know, should buy Albemarle, it'll be game over. You know, Tesla is a $656 billion market cap. If they were to buy Albemarle at a 33% premium, and then, you know, basically, you know, $35 billion sell off. 10 billion, their bromine and catalyst business, and basically get all of Albemarle for $25 billion, that would be equivalent to 4% of Tesla's market cap. So that would be hugely accretive. Like Albemarle is trading at like seven times, you know, forward PE. Tesla is trading at something like 50 or more, you know, PE. So it'd be highly accretive and be highly strategic for Tesla to do this. But here is Albemarle buying a pre production asset. And we know what their criteria are, two times weighted average cost of capital. For them to be seeing that type of return at this type of valuation, to, for them to consider this to be accretive to Albemarle long-term is a great testament to everything that we've been saying that the bottleneck, you know, and where the value is, is in owning your own rock, you know, and in Spodge means software. And that's reflected in other activity on the scoreboard. If you look just Year to date, you know, Sigma's up 33% hard rock. Piedmont's up 26% hard rock. Patriot Battery Metals up 56% hard rock, right? It Winsome's up quite a bit and a few others. Uh, other stocks are, are, are that are non-hard rock are up. You know, Standard Lithium's up 24%. You know, Lithium America's 18%. But the, the, the big rises on the scoreboard are in hard rock. And then another thing to point to why spodumene is where it's at as opposed to refining is look at ganfeng ganfeng's down 20 percent year to date and ganfeng's primarily a refiner of other people's hard rock although they obviously have other assets but so the market's telling you that's where the value is we're going to play a clip here uh jim farley of ford has again been walking the walk you know, uh, on talking about reshoring and, and needing to kind of get into mining. And they've done so a little bit, you know, significantly, you know, into nickel. And um, and I watched Tesla say, we need to be in control of our batteries. Mm -hmm. We need to control the supply of batteries. Mm -hmm. And now it seems like some of the companies that I spoke with nine, 10 years ago are saying, oh, no, 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 we need to be in control of our batteries. <laughs> and, and you know, I'm not saying Ford was one of yeah. those companies. There's actually some of the German brands that, that, yep. that I'm referring to. But, you know, how critical is it? I mean, you're building 43 gigawatt hour of battery yeah. production here, then two more plants in Kentucky, each yeah. having 43 gigawatt hour. And we got of, Michigan, yeah. we got yeah. Turkey. Or globally, we have, you know, so much going on, like you said. I think it's, it's mission critical. I mean, bottom line is, to get to 2 million, which we think is largely incremental, we make about 5 million vehicles a year. Mm -hmm. So 2 million is like a 30% growth for the company in revenue. And most of them are turning out to be new customers like you in the Lightning. Um, so we have to, so the 2 million, my, I've asked my team, by the end of this year, we have to have 
of the raw materials secured for that 2 million units of assembly capacity. Those battery raw materials have to be completely locked down at the end of this year for three years from now. The comments that he made also, you know, sort of mirror Elon Musk on the refining side with not a full appreciation on the upstream, you know, raw material side. What do you make? Let's talk let's, a little bit, bit more about, you know, Liontown Album All from your perspective and, and kind of where we go from here, because this is a hostile bid that still has its, you know, plays to play out. They, they made on-market purchases. Are there other companies making on-market purchases of other spodumene assets or non-spodumene assets as we speak? To go back slightly on what you said, Howard, with the accretive, bearing in mind that Liontown has raised most of the capital, so essentially Albemarle is buying an earnings stream now. Unless there's some slight overruns, the capex has been paid. Now you're just executing on building the project, and it's meant to go into production, I think, second half next year. So that's that's what's on the cards there. It's interesting, as you mentioned, that they've made an on-market purchase. We know because they are publicly disclosed other transactions like Minres owns a stake in Global Lithium. Lithium Americas has a stake in, in Green Tech. We know a number of incumbents and major non-lithium companies are looking at even quite early stage lithium companies and the vast majority being in hard rock. We know what Rio's bought, but we, we know alternatively they're looking at, at now doing a hard rock transaction. So. You make a good point, but Albemarle is essentially buying an earnings stream from here. But yes, you know, if you factor in and extrapolate out what they've paid, what their metrics are, it's quite an aggressive valuation. But it seems as if if you look at the rollout of downstream production, and Ken Brinsden made an important point on our Canada rocks when I asked him about midstream products, and we spoke about Calix. If you look at what is envisaged in Europe and Corpus Christi and elsewhere is a cleaner version of hard rock downstream processing. That's what's envisaged to provide lithium chemicals ex China. So I think we are talking in you know, the bifurcation of markets and what's going to be delivered in. You can, of course, you know, Chile is part of the FTA with the US, so you can ship materials from there so uh, I, I guess it's going to be along certain lines but for the ra you mentioned it and you want to discuss it later in terms of some changes it's a very predefined set of criteria that has to be met but it is a huge market the u.s seems to be pushing hard if you look at this is going to be a big market this can be a 10 million plus ev market with large battery packs and then you've got ess as well and North America in general. So it is a major market that is as big as the whole of the EV market last year, but it's going to be, you know, bigger vehicles. So structuring and preparing for that supply chain, I think, is at the forefront of everyone's minds because as you know, 2030 in lithium world is is a heartbeat. That's like tomorrow. Look, on the scoreboard, uh, Sigma is still a higher valuation than Liontown, and Sigma is closer to production. So why do you think, uh, you know, Almarle has been very well aware of Sigma? I remember five years ago, Calvin Gardner was telling me how he was shipping product, you know, for testing with, with Albemarle. So why why is Albemarle you know, not going after Sigma, which is more immediately going to be producing? Maybe it's the size of the deposit that matters, the geography matters, there's synergies with what else they got in Western Australia. I think Western Australia, and you've mentioned this before, is definitely a, a jurisdiction that Albemarle has historically naturally got a, a huge investment in. And, you know, they understand Western Australia. I don't think that Albemarle has had any exposure to Brazil. No, they haven't, but they are exposed to Chile. So they're, you know, and there are all sorts of emerging markets in China. So Brazil risk might be an element of it. The overall size of the deposit may be another. Again, the synergies with what they're we, doing. We also don't know what Sigma wants for their price. Okay. But, you know, Alma doesn't know what Liontown wants either. And that didn't stop him from buying on market. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, they 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 offered a, what they thought was a substantial premium already in their price, whereas Sigma is already higher valued and there's been no offer and premium. Fair enough. Good point. And we talked about Sigma's premium 
being supported by the fact that it's known to be for sale, whereas Lion Town wasn't known to be for sale and may not be for sale, you know, given the, the way Tim Goiter and other shareholders are acting here. But uh, I think there's an element of market discipline, you know, the spodumene duopoly, uh, we've talked about that, thought they might want to control the near-term production out of Sigma, but Liontown is not that far in the future. We've talked about, I, I would think Albemarle might bring in mineral resources if they do get Liontown to assist with the with the mining. It is an underground mine. I don't buy, I don't fully buy your argument that they're just buying an earning stream. There's still a fair bit of execution risk at Liontown. Um, if you look at you know, Minres or... Yeah, I, I guess I, I just meant Cobra. that the CapEx was there. But if you think about it as well, how I'd look at the offtake and the customers of Liontown are very much aligned to Albemarle. That's true. And Albemarle referenced that in their press release that... And those customers, I think, would be very happy buying from Albemarle and maybe a little bit less happy buying from a junior. And, and, and I think there might even be an argument to say that, you know, Ford or whoever would be happy for Albemarle to process the offtake. Yeah, you're right. Actually, if we put together Ford's comments, you know, from Jim Farley talking about needing of processing and him saying that what Tesla's doing at Corpus Christi is something that they could emulate, Theoretically, the, the megaplex that uh, Albemarle is talking about, Ford could invest in that. I mean, South Carolina is pretty close to Tennessee and blue over. I, I think that that's there's a lot of, you know, like if this this were done, I mean, Core has now signed and, and gone elsewhere to producers, whereas Tesla is in the process of, but yes, to produce Ford, same story. So I think that there there might still be something to be done with the offtake partners of of Liontown for Albemarle. Okay, I want to make some comments just on on our scoreboard. We've made some movements from emerging projects to producer status. So, congratulations to Argosy. Maybe a little bit overdue. We've moved them to chemical producer, given that uh, they are producing, I think, at a rate of two thousand tons of carbonate and. Um, heading to 10,000 tons. We've also moved Core, which had their first shipment of DSO and imminently will be producing spodumene concentrate. And we've also moved up Sayana and Piedmont to producer status, given their announcement this week that they're effectively in commercial production. We've not yet moved Sigma, but expect to do so later this year. And we also see Lithium Americas, who published their first quarter, you know, announcement earlier or this week, where they talked about, uh, you know, production sometime in, in third quarter from Kachari Olaraz, uh, among some other updates on um, timing of the split off of the two companies, and uh, an update on the uh, CapEx at both Kachari Olaraz, which saw an increase, it's another substantial increase, uh, as well as some timing on the on the Thacker Pass. Also want to just make a comment to all the AVZ followers who have lamented the fact that AVZ hasn't been on the RK Equity scoreboard for quite some time. Uh, the RK Equity scoreboard is a public equity scoreboard, and AVZ has been in trading halt since May. I don't know when you invest in a, a public stock, for you, you know, you think you have liquidity of a public stock. For you to not be able to trade a stock for almost a year now. You know, we always talked about the risk to AVZ of being in the DRC. We never, you know, doubted the quality, you know, of the project, but I always doubted, you know, whether or not minority shareholders would, you know, fully benefit. And uh, like I'm saying, like, why not trade? There's risks around there, but like, why not let it trade at some level? So if you own that share, if you want to, you can you could sell it at that level. Anyway, I don't want to go on a long tirade about this, but, you know, Alita you know, the Bald Hill mine is currently in production, and that's not on our scoreboard either, but we're hopeful that there could be a interesting outcome there. I I was a shareholder in Alita, you know, went to zero, but I'm, I'm hearing, you know, maybe I, I, I can get some kind of return out of that if it if it ends up, you know, being restructured and and, and minority shareholders, former minority shareholders are, are, are given some, um, you know, some benefit from that. So let's talk about hydroxide, Rodney, and uh, the CME contract, which you know, Fast Markets and others have been talking about has become more liquid. I got an inbound call from a, a, 
a tier one investment bank last week who wanted to kind of update me as to what's happening, you know, on this hydroxide contract. And also, if you could talk about, you know, we've never seen a premium for hydroxide of the size that to carbonate that we're seeing now. So over the years, whenever like carbonate was higher than hydroxide, you know, Twitter would be filled with like, look, carbonate, you know, we said price parity, but here we've never seen a, a bigger gap. What's causing that? And is that sustainable? And what are the other implications in, in your mind? So just on the on the contract, it's good to see that it's improved. I, I had a look the other day at the open interest and the quotes and the trading volume. Um, there's a little over a thousand open interest. So let's just be clear, that's a thousand tons. So it's not, you know, relative to what I've got is about a million ton market this year, but it, the direction is definitely on the up in terms of of uh, of trading good to see but still a very very small percentage but i guess the the near term direction is the open interest has been improving a lot in the in recent times so there is some liquidity picking up there so we'll see as far as the parity is interesting because i look back at certain tweets and what have you and and the carbonate hydroxide and, and carbonate was for a tiny brief window at the end of 21 went into premium and it's n never happened again i think what is clear though is that carbonate is going to be the trade the bigger trading volumes but if you look at hydroxide hydroxide is still the preferred choice ex china in select markets you've seen the ford deal you know on on the nickel side so they are still going to use high nickel jim farley in that video said lfp for commercial is essentially what he was saying so they're still likely to use a high nickel uh, nmc for the uh for the lightning and so on to be clear the chinese carbonate spot market has grown but what's caused the drop in price recently is is quite thin volumes the Excess supply in the market at the moment is on the cathode and cell side. It's not in the physical chemical side. But we've reached the point now where you can't buy spodumin, enough tons of spodumin to make hydroxide is going to cost you more than buying carbonate. So we know that it's cheaper to reprocess carbonate into hydroxide uh, rather than take spodumin and do the full conversion step. So at some point in time, it's going to make complete sense for a Ganfin or someone else to buy a carbonate and reprocess that and set it into the hydroxide market. So either carbonate's going to start stabilizing or hydroxide is going to come under pressure soon as well. There's no way around this because it is cheaper to buy I mean, I'm hearing quotes of as low as uh, offers as low as 150,000 renminbi, which would be $25,000 for carbonate. I don't know if that was uh, industrial or technical grade or, or battery, but you've still got uh, hydroxide trading in Korea and, and Japan at like $61,000. So there's a you know $36,000 differential between the two when it costs a couple of thousand dollars to to reprocess. So that's not sustainable if you are qualified into selling both markets. There's not that many people that can convert carbonate to hydroxide for tier one battery companies. I mean, Ganfeng is one and, and Albemarle and, and I guess Livent could do it, but Livent doesn't have a ton of capacity you know, or a balance sheet to like- no, there are there are some Chinese converters that can. Um, you know, there the, are guys there, how much spare capacity they have. But my point is this, how it is with that differential, if you have any kind of balance sheet strength, you do well to be buying up all of the carbonate you could at these low prices. Is there, a, is there a lot of carbonate available or is this this spot just very thinly traded, but everyone's like, you know, watching it? It, it, and it looks as if it's, it's quite thin, but we've got a buyer's revolt because essentially uh there is enough cathode downstream so the guys are are not are not ordering i'm surprised because the ev numbers are not bad at all they look pretty respectable and we'll get the the march numbers soon uh, ess has been a little light but there are quite a few projects on the go so fundamentally from the demand side it looks to be in line with what i was hoping to see for the year so that's encouraging but yeah, I mean, it's, it, it seems to be thin volumes. There was this talk in this Reuters article about possibly putting a floor in at 250,000 renminbi, but 
My point is, Howard, is if, if you don't have the capacity to reprocess right now, you do well to buy. I mean, if I were somebody who was naturally short of uh, lithium chemicals and I saw anything offered around 150,000 or 180 or, you know, between 25 and $30,000 a ton, I think I would be buying up. I, I'm surprised it's a bit like when you and I went around the market begging people to buy spodumin at $400 a ton. I think we're starting to get to that point where, you know, you might do well to um, to lift that material, especially if you can find some tolling facilities and you are a natural hydroxide buyer. I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's high as, as nearly $15,000 differential between hydroxide and carbonate. And as I said, you can't even buy spodumin at, at, at enough spodumin to do conversion to hydroxide as you can carbonate. So my guess is either hydroxide comes down or carbonate's going up. I wonder if we'll, we'll see some of these, uh, you know, traditional commodity traders like, you know, Trafigura or Glencore or Traxxas, you know, step in the market, you know, buy some carbonate and then use the forwards market, you know, and sell forward the hydroxide. Although well, the volume's that, that, probably that could too be thin. a logical thing. I mean, if you think about it, Howard, I mean, you look at the BMX. So Pilbara took its BMX material, took the spodium in and has taken a chance on hydroxide forward price. You can do this. Whoever they are doing that with, you can go and buy carbonate and do the same thing. Right. Just ask them to cold treat the carbonate. So we'll we'll and, see. And, these are these are inverted. still these are still nascent, illiquid, you know, markets which will be prone to very significant volatility. And we uh, know that the contract price is, is is quite a lot higher. And we know that there's a lag on that. So the hydroxide and carbonate contract prices are higher. So this is a outright anomaly. I mean. Remind me, I think SQM got fifty-four or fifty-seven thousand dollars a ton for its carbonate in fourth quarter. I think it was fifty-seven. So I'm expecting a dip in the first quarter, but you are nowhere near twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars a ton. No, uh, actually, now that I think about the the forward hydroxide, that the trader told me it's in backwardation. So it may be in this sixty sixty-five range right now, but if you were to sell it forward, you know, nine to twelve months, and you can't sell it forward. Further than that, the price is like fifty for hydroxide. Yeah, I, th I, th I thought I saw it at fifty-five or fifty. But again, if you can buy a twenty-five and convert through a, a is, that, is that where the spot uh, is now? Twenty-five. I'm saying at one hundred and fifty thousand rem nimby, that is twenty-five thousand dollars a ton. If I'm, they're saying that there's some quotes out there at that price, but you can definitely. I mean, I looked at the S SP Global herds, and there is sub two hundred thousand material out there. Right. This looks like typical. You can buy it for under thirty thousand. So you've got a, you've got some warehousing to do. You've obviously got a toll. You've got to treat it through a qualified converter. But I mean, there is a twenty five thousand dollar differential. Okay, to be continued. We don't know what the volumes are there, and there's only so much inventory that could be depleted. This is typical Chinese trading behavior, like. When things are going up, they're bidding it up like crazy. When things are going down, they pull their bids. And, and <laughs> Howard, we've had this conversation many times. They don't have the balance sheet. So what they do is on the app, they can stall it because the banks don't mind and they hold and hold and try and squeeze it up. And on the way down, they did this in 2019 when they are when the price is dropping, they basically convert and sell as quickly as they can. They don't they don't wait at all. Right. Okay, I want to talk quickly about the new the IRA guidance kind of came out uh, as promised, kind of like March 31st. We've had John Miller of Cowan on the program. He said, you know, they'd probably not meet the end of year deadline and, and would focus on, on March 31st. So they did publish something. We'll do more videos to do a deeper dive into this, but there's been some political backlash with Joe Manchin, basically in an op-ed with the Wall Street Journal, talking about it feeling like a, a bait and switch. It, not only is he, did he not get like the permitting that he wanted, but also it looks like you, you know the, the the way they've written the guidelines is to enable many more cars to qualify, whether or not uh, the batteries or the raw materials are coming from America or free trade countries. So that that's his major concern. We'll see how the politics plays out, but but broadly defining things in this way, you know, fundamentally just stimulates more EV demand and hence more, you know, lithium 
supply or, or, or lithium demand and nickel demand and graphite demand. So w- watch this space on the politics. I think the fact that Manchin is so strongly and, and a lot of others talking about like, well, what are you doing? Like we've got <laughs> we've got to develop these things here in the United States and with close allies, but it can't just be, you know, this mineral laundering, right? Is a consideration here, right? Like where tracking this is very difficult. So again, we, we'll do some more videos with other people who are more expert in the weeds of uh, the, the details of, of uh, how this how this is evolving. But I do want to comment on Ford and Vale and YU Cobalt, a four and a half billion dollar in joint venture, which it didn't say how much Ford is investing, but it's got to be in the hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in equity investment in an Indonesian nickel project, which will make an intermediate product. But then Ford is basically saying that part of the joint venture is that YU Cobalt is what's going to is who's going to convert it to nickel sulfate. So both Indonesia and China are not free trade agreement countries with the United States. They haven't yet defined, you know, the foreign entity of concern, but that's always been presumed to be China and Russia. So what is Ford doing processing nickel sulfate in a joint venture with the Chinese in the same way they're looking to partner with CATL on batteries and Tesla is looking <laughs> to partner with CATL on LFP batteries as well was in the press here. Uh, you know, we're having, we've talked about auto OEMs having to get into mining, right? Fordlandia, you know, back in the day, actually Ford buying rubber plantations in Brazil. If you look at the history that didn't work out so well, I don't I think there are iron mines did better in Minnesota, but you know, I wasn't expecting Fordlandia. I was expecting more GM kind of lack, right? Or GM MP materials or, you know, LG Chem Piedmont, right? To be the way that Ford would go. So what do you make of this? And what do you make of Jim oh, the one Farley's thing I comments? Was, was really interesting with, with Jim Farley's. He said he wanted by the end of this year to have secured all the material for starting for three years' time. And they want to produce two million vehicles as a run rate by the end of 26. So we can expect a lot of MA this year then in order to do that. Right. It's going to be a significant challenge. The other thing, I mean, I would ask you which I think you have better insight on as American, what have you, is the antitrust issues of looking how big it's, it's our market share CATL has already in the battery market. That's a good point. I haven't, it's like- they North- 40% of the global battery 40%. market. So okay. What is the, is the US is gonna let them go on and on and on? Is that, is, I, that's, I thought that didn't fly in the US. I, I, I'm not an antitrust you know, expert and I don't know what, percentage ownership and, and global market versus more localized markets, you know, I don't know. So but I think there's less antitrust as it is just like, it is a reality. We, you know, LFP technology was American technology and and here, you know, CATL has, has you know, run with it. Like I see the, the, the Ford CATL deal where basically it would be a technology transfer from CATL to Ford Anyway, we're we're twisting ourselves in knots here. There's a, a big policy to get more EVs on again, the road. Again, there's there's some complexities as well about all of the raw material requirements. And we had this discussion with Matt Fernley for the LFP require, you know, the, the materials for the LFP to be produced in the US and where that was going to come from. It's not without its snags. No, it's not. Th- this whole, by the way, I'm just like, a, a dot connector and trying to like figure things out. So Vale is Brazilian. Vale has been talking about spinning off their nickel and copper assets into a separate kind of vehicle. And GM was talk, you know, was in the press possibly taking a 2% or 3% stake in that for a billion dollars. I'm wondering, might Vale, you know, be a, a, a an out of left field bidder for Sigma OK, again, just hear me out for a second. Ford back in the day had rubber plantations in Brazil. So maybe Ford and Vale are together in nickel. Will Ford and Vale be together in Sigma? 
Is is Brazil a free trade agreement? Country? No, it's not. No, it's not. But you know, so that's. But but they'll they'll lower the cost of their own production much more than they would benefit from the EV subsidy. And I think there may be some loop. Of, Argentina wasn't mentioned, but there's lots of but but Japan. You know they they signed some agreement with. They're now talking with the with the EU countries. So these guidelines are it's not over they're still lobbying to be done so they are fluid and i think the you know, the practical realities of life always make these guidelines fluid and we know ultimately what this comes down to into for, for you know, entities of foreign concern or whatever it is is you know we all know where this where the lines are being drawn here but we'll we'll see how you know how much they they relax it but i think for sure if you listen to what Farley has to say, and if they're legitimately going to go to 2 million vehicle run rate by the end of 26, if you look at uh, roughly the kilowatt hours of what you need plus spare capacity and whatever, you, you, you're in the ballpark of 150 to 200 gigawatt hours. You, you draw down what you need in supply on that, and it looks how it is if Ford is going to be at the forefront of M and A in this year if he wants the job done by the end of twenty three. It's a very good point, and as I said, he's been walking the walk, and now he's talking the talk in nickel. We're just surprised. It puts you know, pressure on GM. Yeah, but GM has been putting pressure on Ford. I think with the deals that they've made in lithium and and rare earths. So I, I see kind of Ford having lagged a little bit, you know, in their. In, in their deal making, they announced a bunch of MOUs, and we did a, a video about this. You know, affordability. You know, is mineral sourcing you know an affordability? But I think you're right. Ford needs to step up its game, and there's a gaping hole, like in their lithium strategy. They were creative with Lion Town with their 300 million, you know, loan, but they need to write equity checks. And again, I'm going to. You didn't really respond. What do you think? Like, why shouldn't Vale as a new entrant kind of come in? To lithium like right in their backyard with sigma yeah i guess if they want to get into lithium that would be a, a definitely a, a possibility for them given their their track record and 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 their origin so uh i mean that's that's a fair point um they'd be comfortable with brazil it's in minas gerais so um yeah, I mean that that would definitely you know be in their wheelhouse. Um, I guess it's a, a question of valuation. So yeah, I mean that that could add another a good stream to their nickel and 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 copper. So I guess that you know that's possible. They don't have any experience, but you know they obviously understand the oil market. But this is, know, this is this is this is open pit. DMS only, they could figure this out, right? If uh, Calvin and I, I could figure it so, out, yeah. Vale could figure it out. <laughs> so any other big news that we're missing in lithium? You know, nickel, I look at the scoreboard, you know, I'm lamenting. I have no idea why, you know, our favorite talent is, is, is off so much. Doesn't kind of make sense. We understand there might have been, you know, a... Uh, a hedge fund, you know, in that, that is, price, that, that's liquidating. The price has been under pressure, for sure. Yeah, it, it has, but um, I think they've underperformed relative to others. I mean, Talon was down like 33% year to date. You know, I, I think that it, it has to do with, you know, a large shareholder um, maybe liquidating his fund, um, it, you know, uh, and has been forced to liquidate some positions here so oftentimes there is no fundamental reason for stocks to underperform or overperform um there, there could be uh all sorts of reasons we'll have uh there's more lots more news to come in the near future but that's yeah well, to, seen recently. to be continued rodney's uh, going on a short vacation for the uh easter and passover break i wish everybody who celebrates um, a great Easter and Passover will be back uh, with more videos after the break. And uh, just want to, uh, again, I forgot at the intro to just 
remind everybody to uh, like and subscribe uh, and comment on these videos if you like what you're hearing and have any questions. And uh, please consider subscribing as Patreons at a $10 tier gives you exclusive access and uh, early access and, 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 and longer form cuts. And at $100, you get uh, a group call with Rodney and me once a quarter. And at the three hundred dollar tier, uh, which is is growing quite nicely, uh, you know, one on one access to Rodney and me, and we could help, you know, advise on a number of things. Although nothing we say in that forum or in this forum uh, is investment advice, so please do your own research. And with that, uh, to be continued.